Uh, I was a brigadier in the British Armed Forces, British Army, Royal Engineers. And at the time of the Falklands conflict, I was commanding 5-9 Independent Commando Squadron, Royal Engineers, which was part of 3 Commando Brigade, Royal Marines. I was also part of Julian Thompson's recce group and planning group. It was my job, as well as commanding 5-9 Squadron, to be part of the very small team that would write and then implement the plan to recover the Falkland Islands. If we took the islands back, we knew the Argentine government was going to fall. And if we lost, apart from the fact that most of us would have been killed, our government would have fallen. So, you know, that, that was a lot of responsibility that the little planning group felt, and certainly Julian and myself felt, right from the word go, from the moment we embarked on our LPD landing platform dock, HMS Fearless, and we all sat down in Julian's cabin to try and work out what we were going to do, because we had no orders at all. We were just told to sail. Our task was daunting. We were about to embark on the longest amphibious operation in military history with a ragtag of amphibious force that was unlikely to achieve our superiority. When we were exposed to other people's ideas, uh, they were completely delusional. And also, we were going to actually do it. <laughs> And we weren't just a, a planning group sitting in some headquarters sending somebody else off to do something. By April the 10th, en route to the South Atlantic, we had a plan. And this was the plan. It was to come in here, seize this area, use our ships as our mobile logistic support, and then fight our way through the mountains here to Stanley. I think that the most difficult part was our logistics. Because, you know, tactics is only the art of what is logistically possible. The Brits have always never quite had enough stuff. So they've always had to improvise and sort of come up with some ingenious solution to get around the fact that they haven't got enough firepower or enough vehicles. My father was, was in China, uh, commander of the British military mission in China. And they couldn't resupply him. The British couldn't, because they, they were having to fly over the hump, as it was called, over Everest. So what they would do is they would fly in crates of whiskey and money to him, and then he would trade with Stilwell's U.S. Army Group uh, for all his spares and everything. So that was his logistics. I feel extremely honored to be a member of the Marines Memorial, and I, and I believe I was Allied member number one. <laughs> It's an extraordinary place. We're so lucky to have it. There is no club like this which is completely inclusive. And that's one of the great things about America, where everyone's contribution is valued. And this club embodies that. The work it does for the Gold Star families is, is laudable. I just can't speak more highly of, of this facility, the people who run it, the staff, and the friendliness of everyone. It's the one place I come to where I feel at home. I never, ever wanted to be anything else other than a soldier, and I wanted to be a parachutist, and I wanted to be a commando. To me, that campaign was the, everything, everything that I wanted to be since I was a small child. A classic operation like the Falklands, which was very, <laughs> black and white. <laughs> I mean, this is British territory. You can argue going back before that. You can say the British had it before Argentina was a country and whatever. Here you had British people on an island that were invaded, and we went down and took it back. And we really felt good about that. It, the British people felt good about that. They were fed up with being kicked around. And they gained a huge amount of self-respect and pride in the fact that they could do it. And I was very lucky to be part of it.